Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Cultural Heritage Threats and the Role of Citizen Engagement Inside and Outside Universities. This is an outreach and community learning event of the INOS project at ampersand INOS project, also at web to learn underscore EU and online at uh, web to learn EU. Today's event is open to amateurs and experts interested in how cultural heritage can be protected and preserved under extreme societal conditions and how citizen engagement can be enhanced through cooperation between citizen communities and higher education institutions. Today's talks are focused on work being carried out by individuals and cultural organizations inside and outside Ukraine. We're not conducting a referendum on the war itself. That's beyond our skills and abilities here. Rather, we are together as a community trying to understand how the possibilities of both top-down and bottom-up action work in a time of crisis. What can citizens and conveners do to help preserve and uh, share culture? We have, uh, you don't have to be an expert in the field or a specialized researcher in the cultural sector to follow along today. Everyone's welcome to join. We have five tremendous speakers, uh, Andreas Segerberry, Julia Pegel, Vasily Rosko, and Stefania Ikonomou, and Katerina Zoru from web to learn uh, We will do the speakers one at a time. Each speaker will speak for no more than 10 minutes. I'll be very strict with the time to keep things moving. And then at the end, we have about a half an hour budgeted for questions and discussion. If you have a question, hold it till the end and then put it in chat also. If you have trouble technically, need help, or also if you, um, um, uh, well, if you have trouble, need help, a question, you can message uh, Katrina or I, the co-hosts directly, and we'll try and help you out. We are operating today under a code of conduct, uh, Katerina will put that link in the chat now. Uh, this is a, these are cutting edge events. There's a lot at stake and uh, there are limits on what we can and can't discuss today, but basically be kind. And with no more formalities, I believe, we can go straight into the first talk. I think uh, we're going to do uh, have a minute uh, with Katrina to say a few words about the INOS project and the funder, and then we'll go to Julia. Katrina, go ahead and unmute, and the floor is yours. I'm Katrina Zura, and I'm going to do two short things with you. First is to present the project within which this webinar takes place, and the second is to link the project with the, uh, the scope of today's uh, webinar. I'm Katarina Zhu, I'm the head of web to learn and one of the initiators of the INOS project. This is an ongoing project uh, led by the University of Aalborg in Denmark. The full title of INOS is Integrating Open and Citizen Science into Active Learning Approaches in Higher Education. Six lovely partners and I would like especially to thank Liber for being our communication expert today and forever. <laughs> the motivation of INOS project is um, to push towards greater adoption of open and citizen science at universities and society at large. And we have three key objectives. Very quickly, it is about broadening, broadening open frameworks of collaboration beyond citizen science practices. It is about making um, teaching and learning practices much more rooted into uh, open collaboration and open science together with society. And it's about a range of citizen science projects such as datathons, service jams, democracy workshops, knowledge cafes, fab labs, etc. And to connect the, the value of these beautiful citizen science initiatives to con connectivity, learning potential and capacity building inside and outside uh, the universities who have beautiful results. Uh, you're all very much invited to have a look at them. Of course, they are open access, uh, totally in line with the INOS uh, spirit. Um, today's webinar connects 
um, the power of citizen science and it focuses more on uh, citizen engagement by looking more particularly in cultural heritage preservation inside and outside universities. And uh, we are very keen in discussing how cultural heritage protection and preservation can happen in challenging times by means of uh, civic engagement. We take uh, Ukrainian cultural heritage and the threat as the current context of this uh, webinar. And now I will move on to the justification of this um, um, uh, mindset of uh, the, the willingness to bring forth the value of civic engagement into cultural heritage preservation. This is a very quick overview of um, a kind of radical um, blog post that I had the pleasure to go over with my colleague, uh, Stefania um, Economou. So we see four barriers to action taking and four incentives for, for action take, taking in the current um, Ukrainian cultural heritage um, uh, context. The four barriers that we see uh, very quickly is first the overexposure to distressing media sources. People are uh, overwhelmed by the intensity of uh, images and videos from uh, war and some of them feel paralyzed um, and incapable of taking action to help those on, in need. The second is that despite our willingness to connect with colleagues and friends in Ukraine, the daily routines are so uh, disrupted that we, we are uh, we're having difficulties in, in connecting and in um, bonding and finding ways to co collaborate into um, cultural heritage preservation and uh, reuse. The third is this um, um, statement that uh, because uh, the conflict is ongoing and the end is unknown, this is used sometimes as a, as a game stopper by some uh, people. The fourth is that some, some people also label um, um, the Ukrainian war as highly sensitive and that sometimes prevent people from dealing with that. Uh, so political debates can trap uh, people and impact people uh, action taking um, um, possibilities. So we we we, uh, we see for incentives in in action taking. The first that we see a tremendous value in technology and diaspora, in uh, connecting people in and outside Ukraine, all sorts of backgrounds and profiles from the cultural sector to join forces to take action. Um, the second is about um, a general statement about uh, the power of activism and the value. Uh, we see an unprecedented spread of digital activism to support social purposes, especially in Ukraine. We think that um, there have been many acts of digital volunteering and the webinar actually is all about that. Uh, the third is uh, the universal role of uh, culture in bridging dichotomies. And the fourth is the importance that we see in the immediacy and action. This is a very um, strong citations in, a, in our opinion from Andreas, who, that we had the pleasure to hear. If you don't act once, the material uh, risks disappearing, the material, the, the, the archives and the digital assets uh, in, in this sense. And of course, Andreas mentioned also Sebastian, uh, both work in the Sutso project that Andreas just showcased. And that citation is also very important to us, where he, um, he explains why the immediacy of action was so needed, because when he was archiving, uh, as Andreas was saying, night and day, uh, these digital archives of uh, Ukrainian cultural heritage, he realized that he was um, uh, luckily, very quick into saving because after some uh, hours, uh, the, the site has been uh, bombarded and uh, the, 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 the Ukrainian site, um, he, he got, uh, he, he, he lost the connection with the archive, but uh, eventually he, he was successful in making a digital copy out of that. So we we certainly we emphasize the immediacy and action in, into that. So very quickly, that is the point of the webinar. Uh, we believe in the agility, rapidity, and eagerness to act. It is very important also to bridge 
bottom up and top down initiatives from institutions. And now I will hand over also to Julia to tell us how uh, institutions and cultural heritage organizations react to that together with uh, bottom up initiatives. And we think that technology expands the way citizens engage in a common cause as uh, new forms of digital activism are being developed, especially in the cultural heritage preservation um, uh, context. So thank you very much. I hand over to Mike. Who will then hand over to Julia. Thank you, Katerina, very much for laying out the, the groundwork there. And for those of you who don't know, Katerina and Stefania's work and their team at uh, Web2Learn, I recommend that you check it out. They're really actually quite on the uh, on the cutting edge of events that are happening right now in the digital, physical, cultural, educational world. So thank you, Katerina, for, for having us all today. Here's uh, Andreas Segerberry. Andreas is one of the 1,500 volunteers of the Sucho Initiative, where he contributes with coordination and software development. When not working with Sucho, Andreas is a research engineer and lecturer in digital curation at the University of Gothenburg or Jotabari in Sweden. Thank you and welcome, Andreas. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, just making sure that you can see my presentation. Okay. Looks great. Thank you. So, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sucho, which is a or became a global community of volunteers uh, with the aim to help to preserve Ukraine's online cultural heritage. Uh, I'm going to start this talk with a, with a timeline. I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal involvement and how, how the, the, the group Sucho came to, in to be. So, of course, on February the 24th, we had the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. My background is, is from, from academia and, and uh, I've had a long interest in, in uh, web archiving, technology methods and, and, and so forth. So I had a background in, in those things. So uh, the full-scale invasion started on, on the 24th. On the same day, we did, I did, together with uh, just a very loose group of people that I know, in panic started to uh, targeting and saving the most obvious sites, like the president site, like the big culture, uh, governmental sites. And you could see now in, in retrospective, we can see that there were a lot of people that was trying to do stuff uh, on their own. So there were a lot of people who tried to use the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine to archive to a, a function that calls, is called Save Page Now, where you can put in a link and it will be saved into the Wayback Machine. And this little image here is a, a small example of the president's site. And you can see that it's, uh, it gets a lot of intensity and a lot of people is in there and trying to, to save stuff. Uh, also, we had uh, the International Council of Museums called on civil society in Ukraine to assist their local museums and to protect their holdings. And this was for locals uh, within Ukraine. Obviously, I would say that they had probably other things to think about <laughs> than this. But nevertheless, there was a call. Another initiative is the archive team who is a, did major website calls with a crowdsourced computing power that's called uh, Warrior. Uh, I would, don't think I have the time to speak too much about that. So where, where did we start? How, from, from, from this first day, we only did like the, the, the most obvious stuff. But then we tried to, you know, figure out, okay, where, how can we, you know, figure out stuff from a country that I know very little, little of. I know like the capital's name, the president's name, but not so much more. So we used Wikidata as a, as a source. So we queried for official uh, governmental sites that were uh, in, in Wikipedia, and we tried to extract the official website URL. Uh, and this was on the, the day after. And then we managed to extract like 1,300 URLs from, from these Wikipedia articles. 
on February the 26th, we, uh, um, we finally got some contact with the Ukrainian authorities. And it was still, you know, I called a friend and a friend of a friend finally knows someone in Ukraine and gave me the phone number. And uh, we got in contact on, on, on uh, WhatsApp. And we try, they helped us a lot to identify and prioritize the most important websites. On February the 28th, uh, Sebastian Maestrovic, uh, who has a background in digital humanities and in, is a PhD candidate in history uh, and has a, a background, uh, he's, he's from the former Yugoslavia and has experienced uh, damage to the cultural heritage by war. He, he laid sleepless one night after I'm thinking about how to save the digital heritage. So he put out this tweet that you know, got a very good spread. And within a few days, uh, several hundred volunteers joined to try to, to save uh, as much as possible from the Ukrainian uh, museums, archives, libraries, galleries, uh, and so forth. I'm not going to dwell into too much detail uh, here, but here's a basic. Uh, you will have the the, the presentation uh, afterwards, and it's going to be links and you some text that you can read. Uh, but this is the basic workflow, and I'm going to in the next few slides just uh, talk a little bit about the roles of Sucho. And the power is in the number of people. Maybe <clears throat> that's a key thing. And there is a task suitable for anyone, regardless of their uh, tech skills. So people were link collectors, collecting links, trying to find you know, stuff to archive, new museums. We have those who use the Internet Archives batch processing uh, service, where you could basically put a lot of URLs in a Google Sheet, and it will be ingested to the Internet Archive. We have people who uh, do manual recording uh, of uh, where we can't put a web crawler, uh, and then you need a human being to, so to speak, uh, interact with the web page to capture. This is a, an archaeology site of some sort that some that you can go in, and that's ne <clears throat> a necessity for uh, archiving those complex sites. We have those who work with metadata create, uh, curating. We have those who uh, actively archive the web. <laughs> Some sites, and this is the thing that I've been doing the most of the time is being uh, targeting the really difficult stuff that needs custom scripting and stuff. We have people that do situation monitoring and they try to focus and see how the war is developing and helping the collectors and the other people to prioritize what content that needs to be saved first. For instance, if, they, if we see that there are shellings in, in one part of Ukraine, we have to focus on that part. <clears throat> Here's some statistics just for fun. Uh, we average on 4 million saved pages a day between uh, this only goes uh, from mid-March to the end of March, but I would say we had the same uh, during the whole, whole of April as well. So about 4 million uh, pages saved to the Internet Archive a day. We have these numbers, 40 terabytes of scanned documents, artworks, and other digital materials. And this special collection that focused on governmental uh, websites, uh, over 6,500 websites are now safeguarded. And the archive team, they have done more uh, broad scoped uh, collections of the top domain and, and some uh, news and TV broadcasts. So some lessons learned. Open data has been absolutely essential for the success for this. We have used zone files for trying to identify uh, 
domains and subdomains. Wikidata, as I mentioned before. OpenStreetMaps for uh, locating, for instance, where uh, museums are. And from there, we could extract you know, URLs and, and, and so forth. So uh, one thing with, with this is um, with this community of people, obviously all of us, we work in, in institutions, but Sucho, we are so non-gov that we can't even be a non-gov. <laughs> Because you and which could be troublesome sometimes if you want to apply for fundings and stuff like that, because we are not a, an official non gov. But uh, we do a lot of things, and we uh, one key thing of not being uh, 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 an institution is that we could act very, very quickly without any bu uh, bureaucracy. So, some of the next steps I know that my time is running out. Uh, but I just want to mention that the next steps when we have now have done this huge amount of collecting of the online materials, we are now doing some co coordination of donations of digitizations equipment that will be sent into Ukraine for further digitization. And we also uh, are seeking for long term partnership with institutions that could take care of the collected material and the storage and the management for how long it's now is going to be needed. And with that, I say thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Andreas. Uh, that was terrific. And go ahead and unshare your screen. And I know I'm going to have a couple of questions to you uh, for you in the Q&A, particularly about the use of uh, Internet Archive as a piece of infrastructure. Uh, now, to Julia Pagel. Julia is the Secretary General of NEMO, the Network of European Museum Organizations. She'll tell you a little bit more about herself and NEMO in her talk. Uh, Julia, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me try and check whether uh, the PowerPoint shares with you. Uh, da, 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 da. Perfect. It looks perfect. That is great. Okay. Um, thanks for the introduction, Mike, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about NEMO's initiative with the European Museums to support um, the Ukrainian colleagues. Um, before I start my presentation, as uh, Mike has already said, I would like to introduce NEMO just super briefly to you. We're a network representing and working for the museum community in Europe. We have 130 members in 40 countries. And just to give you a main idea of what we're doing, we uh, do a lot of advo advocacy um, for museums vis-a-vis -vis policymakers, mostly European institutions, European policymakers. Uh, we, inter we initiate international cooperation between museums, help museums to work on European level, attract European funding. We act as information platform uh, to share good practices and information. And we offer capacity building to our museum professionals in Europe on all matters relevant to museum work. Now, and having said this, quick realities check um, to give you an idea about the actual organization that represents 30,000 museums in Europe with a large activity portfolio. We are an organization of eight staff members and only one of them working full time and that's me. Uh, so much for the resources uh, and capacities to facilitate cooperation and exchange within the sector at European level. I actually want to put an emphasis on that, uh, size versus ambition and scope. I think when it comes to cultural heritage institutions and NGOs like ours in Europe, we're not an exception in terms of size and resources. Actually, most of the cultural sector organizations in Europe are regarded as so-called micro businesses with less, less than 10 staff. And while this might be a disadvantage when it comes to creating big impact, uh, I think uh, there is an undeniable advantage, and that is being quick and uncomplicated and without an administrative nightmare to uh, overcome when it uh, comes to taking decisions. 
And in this connection, and here I'm really echoing what um, Andreas has said before, I want to raise another point, which I think it's important. Uh, it starts with a quote, it's all about people. And this comes from the founder of Nemo, Frank Birkebach. This was actually among the first uh, things I learned from him. And back then when I was new at the organization, I was thinking, what is he talking about? We are a network of organizations, actually umbrella organizations. We are not a network of individual people. But then in the years till now, I realized that he was completely right from the start because it doesn't help you per se to be connected on paper to UNESCO or 30 national museum organizations or the European parliament. It's about seeing the people behind the organization or rather seeing the organization as a conglomerate of people and identifying their shared objectives and values. And this is what gets things rolling. And coming back to this specific situation now uh, uh, in Ukraine with the war in Europe, um, it is extremely important to speak and appeal to these people in their individual capacities as colleagues and citizens and to activate them and get active beyond their comfort zone or maybe job description. So I want to tell you how um, we got into getting active. Uh, maybe first, um, uh, what about the process? Um, this relates very much to our ability as a small organization to make decisions quickly. My colleague from the Netherlands contacted me on February 25th in conjunction with our statement on the war in Ukraine. She told me that various colleagues in Europe had already contacted her asking for more information coordination. The next call was from a colleague in Portugal who asked how they could help their colleagues in Ukraine. And that was the start of our initiative. We re realized that some kind of coordination platform uh, for the office was needed. And so we organized a call through our network and partners via all possible channel channels to European muse museums and institutions. And we organized a special page on our website, organized different categories of possible support. And we started collecting and monitoring the activities sent to us. Uh, purpose of the initiative is next to supporting Ukraine. Um, we wanted this page to inspire and maybe encourage more colleagues from all over Europe to do something, because even the smallest gesture is uh, a start. And I think another advantage is uh, of this collection is that it's a proof for us in the future uh, that we can be agile. Uh, and museums can take a stand. And sometimes we all know that um, museums give us the impression that they don't. So since we launched the call, we've had 150 museum colleagues messaging us, sending their initiatives uh, or getting information from us. And in the following, I just want to run through, because I know I'm restricted on time, through some of the <laughs> um, initiatives that we were sent. Um, uh, apparent, uh, obviously, a lot of um, museums called us providing storage spaces and housing for refugees, especially in the first weeks, uh, a lot of museums contacted us for these matters. We have uh, received different kinds of donation initiatives uh, next to many museums donating earnings from ticket sales, some museums organized events to raise money like charity auctions or concerts, uh, helping to collect foods and goods and medical and hygiene supplies. We've received diverse uh, support initiatives in the area of uh, education and exhibitions, museums offering language courses for Ukrainian refugees or giving guided tours through museums and the new towns, uh, organizing exhibitions about war, Russia, the invasion and propaganda. A lot of museums and funding organizations have created job opportunities for Ukrainian colleagues coming to Europe, creating scholarships or research fellowships for them. And I think the most recent support initiatives focus on how to help the colleagues and collections in Ukraine on the ground. And we'll hear more about that from Vasil, I guess, uh, later on. Um, so instead of bringing cultural heritage from Ukraine to a safe space outside, uh, it's actually about helping them on the ground there. And that also goes for sharing experience with documentation, digitization and inventory of Ukrainian collections. Yeah, this just as an idea and quick summary of how uh, of some of the offers that we've had. Uh, we had 5,000 visits on our webpage last month and high attention on our social media channels. And I think that shows the interest and also the need for 
coordination because there are so many initiatives uh, working parallelly. And maybe um, talking about crisis moments and the war in Ukraine now being the most extreme and intense crisis currently, I think it makes sense to really look back at other crises and what we might have learned from them. And there is a very recent one, the COVID-19 pandemic, which heavily impacted on the museum sector globally. And I think what we've learned from this one is that we can be flexible, actually more flexible than most of us think in their everyday life. The fact that within a week uh, in the war, the first supporting offers were underway and new actions in museums were born out of present needs really gives me hope that we are, after all, prepared for an uncertain future. And I think another learning is that in crisis, we really have to stick together. Uh, and with Nemo, we have witnessed that during the pandemic and again now during the war, the need for museums to get in touch with each other, with their peers, to exchange about next steps and how to's and to create a, a stronger voice was really immense. And networks are an important platform for that. Yeah, so much for our initiative, uh, successful so far, but there are a lot of unanswered and uncomfortable questions uh, that I have not included in my presentations because I don't have a full answer to them, but I look forward to discussing them with you. I think for one, there's the question about how long the initiative will run is that like an endless initiative. And this question is connected to how much media and attention is influencing the willingness to help on a general level. And now in our case on for the heritage sector, we, for example, have noticed that the peak of offers for support was provided in March, April until mid-May, and then gradually declined from say 10 offers per week to one or two per week. And I think one a reason clearly is that media attention has turned elsewhere. Uh, but we also know, and that's promising, that a lot of contacts between museums and professionals have now been established, and the collaboration is happening now without us as a coordinating entity. And that, in the end, is the original idea of a network. There is no center. Uh, there are just network members being connected and working together on a basis of a shared vision and mission, so somehow mission accomplished. <laughs> I'm going to end my presentation here on this positive note, although I think that these questions are still open. Look forward to discussing them with you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was terrific. Our uh, next speaker is Vasily Rosko. Vasily is the head of Tustan, the Tustan NGO. He does heritage site management and crisis management, also digital heritage documentation and preservation slash presentation. Vasily, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Hello to everybody. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for this opportunity, Katarina. Uh, uh, it's not only a possibility to uh, tell about uh, Ukraine, today, but also to meet uh, Liv with Andreas Suchua and Julia, which helped us a lot. We connected with Nemo. So uh, I will tell a few words about uh, Heritage Emergency Response Initiative, um, and I try to accent on uh, questions uh, you mentioned about the role of citizens and initiatives from uh, below, and uh, some um, some lessons learned. So uh, first of all, it's a volunteer uh, initiative of museums and uh, um, first of all, Maidan Museum and Tustan NGO. So we are museum workers, architects, uh, museologists, and uh, we started this as our part of war uh, while we are in uh, apparently uh, safely placed in Western Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, for example, I, uh, before, in previous life, I took care of Tustan uh, site. Uh, we did 3D and uh, take care and uh, long it to sustainability and all those ability to work with heritage and understanding we took to Harry initiative. It's a part of our expertise. So, um, 
we have uh, different levels of uh, goals. Uh, first of all, to have capacity to act, but also uh, partly to act now to um, do some uh, urgent things, but also to do something for future, uh, which will last and after the war. Um, and which will change our uh, heritage system, which uh, partly is uh, post-Soviet, and it's a great problem and uh, low possibility to react because of its uh, not, not, not reforming uh, state after Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, we feel a lot uh, help of uh, world in uh, materials, money for urgent uh, needs for people, for materials to pack uh, artifacts and to hide them. Uh, so it's uh, first uh, block of activity, but we started in different uh, areas um, and I will return to the slide. So um, we also uh, think about a center for a uh, rescue center uh, with the team which will be able to react. So now it's uh, some separate uh, activities, um, but uh, it will be the, the huge direction in future with regional offices because firstly we started in Lviv then in Kyiv also the second, and we dream that in each big city, in Dnipro, uh, Kharkiv, Odessa will be the center for re reaction. Uh, other work is uh, to gather, to, to build integrated data infrastructure, and that's why uh, scanning archives, uh, paper, I mean, and uh, documenting 3D in 3D uh, heritage uh, are the database for, for this. Um, and uh, rescue expeditions, also a part of our activity um, to um, damage its heritage. But also education is important to uh, manual what to do, um, uh, trainings, databases for, for actions. So uh, just to, to hotline to ask questions uh, of uh, museum workers what to do. And uh, also communication is uh, important to, 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 to change uh, system the um, And always we connect with uh, R&D and analytics because uh, I'll show you, for example, we did, I have possibility to share my screen so I will show you uh, live. Uh, now the best, uh, do you see the text? Yes. yes. Uh, so for now, uh, there are many initiatives to document heritage, but the best is now on min Ministry of Culture side. So uh, it's ver verificated. And uh, on this basis, uh, we not, not to du duplicate, uh, uh, we started to uh, do GIS, uh, so we put uh, all museums because um, eight years ago I did this registry in uh, the ministry. So two and a half thousand of Ukrainian museums we put into GIS and uh, with the line of fire uh, because uh, the news are about damages are only the part of problem. We know that there are much more objects uh, left there with collections, and besides uh, 140,000 objects of immovable heritage. So with this uh, internal GIS, we can uh, research all uh, all period line of, of fire and to understand the whole territory under occupation for further verification inventory of each part. So rockets, missiles are the damages uh, heritage. Um, and it's uh, a part of uh, my responsibility in Harry because uh, Ivor Pushvalo, I think well known <laughs> To, to, to you um, is uh, take care of some other things. But also we started... Um, and a webinar. webinar. 
Well, uh, I'll show you another another uh, part. So uh, also interesting, uh, important thing is um, rescue expeditions um, to damaged objects. It started suddenly uh, to Borodyanka. Do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, so it's famous Borodyanka shell. Uh, we understood that we can lost it uh, in a few days because of weather and so we decided to rescue it to museum collection um, for further generations. But before we uh, we should fix this, so we did a 3D uh, de detailed 3D model uh, with the help of photogrammetry, and uh, also the model of uh, the whole um, buildings around uh, this. And uh, uh, these expeditions became complex. We uh, understood that we should uh, gather some artifacts, uh, for example, toys or uniform of occupants or some other things uh, for future generations. We also uh, took oral histories um, and uh, documented with the help of ICROM methodics uh, assessment on site on eight pages about structural stability and other other things and uh, so uh, after this we started to do this uh, constantly and uh, the next expedition was to the wooden church to Vyazivka. do you see the picture yes so uh, it's in Zhitomir region and uh, what's interesting is that it's uh, uh, Russian uh, church um, and uh, in Kharkiv was the next level of our expeditions because we uh, could do this uh, with the help uh, already of local uh, specialists, uh, museum uh, workers and architects and um, workers of uh, security service uh, on the basis of our material started um, criminal proceedings. Uh, do, do you see the video or not? Yes. Uh, proceedings on, on the basis of, uh, our, of this uh, work. So I return to my slides. So I lost my, <laughs> That's my okay. oh, here. Okay. So um, about cooperation. Uh, cooperation is on different levels. First of all, with other initiatives, um, Ukrainian and international, uh, there are many. So uh, specialization is important because, for example, when Olya Honchar uh, speaks about uh, money for salaries for people, then we try to do something other. And uh, for um, cooperation also platforms are important. And after um, um, first months of uh, helping with materials, we did uh, with ICOM Ukraine and uh, Promuseum platform uh, to gather, um, one platform to get information from museums because we know that some museums ask uh, for a few times different initiatives and some uh, do not get uh, not anything. And it, uh, this platform uh, will also be important, I think, to donors and to, to report. Uh, but uh, the other cooperation is this ministry. So it's important to speak with, to try to help with their capacity and to build uh, um, vision vision of future and to speak about this and uh, sustainability is our uh, result we hope uh, so uh, there are many challenges uh, it's hardly to think during war you know but it's very important to think because we, we are lack of resources of mental resources and uh, emotions are high and it's very important to uh, to think how to use this uh, not not big resources of people first of all 
and uh, challenges uh, knowledge management uh, because uh, there are many many data of situation of uh, possibilities uh, which you provide which internal are uh, and uh, with, with local situation so uh, it's a challenge to 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 cooperate uh, to combine self coordination self organization with coordination so it's a balance <laughs> challenge and that uh, possibilities um, became um, become huge and uh, challenges so it's parallel uh, and uh, finishing my presentation um, a war is a pain and suffering but uh, also it can become a possibility to jump and to do something that we didn't have before and uh, that's why we try to think uh, about building something that will stay after the war and will make a heritage system stronger than before um, thank you and here are some details in report and facebook and we'll put those links uh, into chat and also into follow up communication on uh, okay. the web to learn site for people in the chat who are looking for more information. Thank you, Vasily. Um, it's very hard to um, move to another speaker after that. Um, uh, uh, so uh, with a deep breath, we'll move to Katerina and Stefania's talk and then come back uh, to you and others in the questions and answers. But thank you very much for sharing all, all of that with us today. Katrina and Stefania, the floor is yours. Thanks, Michael. I'm gonna do slide sharing. Uh, I think you can see my slides, right? Yes. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, today, we are also focusing on how citizens can engage in the protection and preservation of Ukrainian cultural heritage. And so let's get right into the theme. So when we talk about citizen engagement, we talk about how we want to understand how citizens can be agent, agents of change in their communities. Of course, nowadays, digital tools and technologies can empower people to take action for cultural heritage preservation. And of course, uh, put people in this process, make them feel more uh, uh, the, the value of uh, engaging for their community's cultural heritage. Of course, there are uh, several forms of technology-mediated citizen engagement. We have digital humanitarians, internet activists, uh, digital volunteers, people coming from many different sectors, from citizen science, social computing, citizen journalism, etc. Um, here you can see our collection uh, on Padlet. It's a collection of initiatives that was that were carried out to help protect and preserve Ukrainian cultural heritage. Initiatives carried out by cultural heritage organizations, higher education institutions in Europe, and of course citizen communities. So I'll briefly present you three of such initiatives. The first one is the Backup Ukraine Initiative which is set up by Polycom in partnership with uh, Blue Shield Denmark, UNESCO and Virtue Futures Innovation Lab. So the goal here is to gather in an open access repository, 3D models of Ukrainian cultural assets. And what is of great importance here is that ordinary citizens are actively engaged in this process because they can scan and then store as 3D models their the cultural assets, the pictures they take from cultural monuments on the ground. And another initiative that is based on collective participatory and an open innovation approach is the Translate a Story Ukraine initiative that is organized by UNESCO in collaboration with many other partners. This initiative was firstly launched during the pandemic to serve as a tool to enhance remote early age reading. So in this case, uh, this initiative aims to translate early grade books into Ukrainian through crowdsourcing which entails a joint work carried out by volunteers all around the world. And uh, the third initiative is about uh, some actions taken by the MOM Museum in Lithuania. Uh, the MOM Museum has organized a series of activities to support the Ukrainian cultural sector, 
Among the, more import, the most important of them are the Ukrainian poetry readings and the museum's crowdfunding uh, initiatives. Of course, we have also uploaded our collection on GitHub, so it can be freely accessible to anyone to consult. So among all these several uh, initiatives carried out to protect and preserve Ukrainian cultural heritage are hackathons. So a hackathon is a digital and participatory action that aims to provide quick and effective uh, solutions to social problems. A hackathon uh, lasts for two or three days, and it's a great opportunity to enhance citizens' digital skills, while also foster cooperation and collective action towards a commonly set goal. So we at web to learn we are organizing a hackathon for Ukrainian cultural heritage currently under threat. Our hackathon challenge Will, be, will take place in the context of the EU Space for Ukraine Hackathon Initiative that is organized by the European A Union Agency for the Space Program. This hackathon will run from the 29th of June and it will last till the 1st of July. And it will entail the use of Earth observation data for humanitarian aid. So a few words about the hackathon challenge. Uh, in, the, in our challenge, we use Earth observation and space data to monitor threats and damage in Ukrainian cultural heritage. So it will be a challenge in which both citizens and professionals will come together, work with the data, and finally release results in an open access format. Uh, we'll use Earth observation and space data freely accessible by European systems Galileo and Copernicus. So to achieve our challenge uh, goal, we need people coming from a diverse professional backgrounds to engage in a joint three days effort. Uh, of course, technology and digital tools will support experts and citizens on the ground to take action, both on site and remotely. We need experts in earth observations, like people coming from the GEOS International Scholar Community, but as well, we need experts in cultural heritage, both in Ukraine and abroad. So, if you're, if you're working in the cultural health sector or you're a cultural enthusiast or you're an earth observation data expert and this hackathon challenge seems interesting to you, you can email, email us and we'll share with you all information related to our hackathon challenge and let you know how you can be part of it. And just a few words about our coming Enos webinar on the 7th of July. We are glad to host uh, scientists to talk about academic activism uh, we host uh, Gianluca Grimalda and Laura Horn from the Scientist Rebellion team. We also host uh, Luigi Ceccaroni, an expert in citizen science, and Jaume Piera, an expert in uh, marine observation data. And of course, we have together with us Caterina Zuru and Michael Peter Edson. So see you there also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefania. I think now we'll move into uh, a question dialogue discussion. If you have questions out there uh, among the, the participants, go ahead and put them into chat. And we'll, I think all of the panelists, but mostly Katerina and Stefani and I will try and pull, pull things up uh, and uh, recast the questions to our speakers today. Um, I have one Im very immediate question that I think is probably on the mind of almost everyone in the room. And I want to go speaker by speaker, starting in the in the the, uh, the same order we went, starting with you, Andreas. If people want to know what to do, <laughs> what I as an individual can do, can you point us to some place to start? First to you, Andreas. Well, that's a very hard question, I guess. Because <laughs> I, I, <laughs> oh, actually, so let a, me let me. You're yeah. you're all thoughtful people, but let me start with some a, a question about that. Why, why is that a hard question? Not a question to you. It is a hard question. Yeah. Why yeah. is that so hard in our sector? Maybe um, one thing that I've been thinking about and that that I wanted to have, you know, before this is was like I wanted to know people from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Why didn't I know people in Ukraine? Why didn't and other things that have come to my mind? Why didn't I act? in Syria? Why didn't I act in, in other conflict areas? Um, maybe lack of contacts, uh, 
maybe, I don't know, but that's something that has crossed my mind many times. Why haven't I done this uh, before? Mm. And um, I think this is this is something that we really can, you know, <laughs> uh, make a lesson of that we need to work more with with networking. I think that's one very essential thing. That's a, a beautiful answer. Um, but and then the second part of the question, <laughs> what? Um, and and let me put it, it give you time to think. Put it in some context. Um, yeah. Back when I was working with a UN project we had this phenomenon we called the so what mm. phenomenon. So what do I do? A bunch of us yeah. went to see Ai Weiwei's film during the migration crisis, Human Flow. Mm. And we all got very emotionally involved in that uh, movie and we left the movie theater and we looked at each other and go now, so what the F are we supposed to do? Mm. Um, so I've been curious about this for a long time. Mm. Is there a listserv we can join, a website we should follow, a friend we should make? I, yeah, you should. If, you, if you're if you interested in, in, in Suture's work, right now we are basically, uh, what you could say, done with, with the collecting the the um, the online digital, digital heritage uh, that was posted online. So that part is really done. But please keep a, a, an eye on, on Suture's website. It's going to be a press release. Uh, uh, within a few weeks, where we're going to talk about the next steps, where we are going forward with more uh, equipment donation and donation of um, um, training materials or training time, consulting time for uh, for Ukrainian glams. So, so keep an eye on that. But I, I think everyone needs to, you know, uh, think of what can I do, and, and that was what I did when I <laughs> when this all happened I mean I don't have a driver's license I'm afraid of guns I don't know anything about medical health care but I do un know a lot about web archiving so <laughs> <laughs> so I think people who can drive a bus should do that and people so if you're good at something you know think about if you can make it to something useful for for people in need well, wow, beautifully said. Julia, what are your thoughts about this from your position? Uh, uh... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice that, that you're mentioning the networks because I think this is, this is one of the most important aspects is that you actually have these communication channels, some kind of channel that, that gives you the access to the actual people. Uh, and uh, in our case, uh, we had to because we don't we have only one member in, in Ukraine, uh, and this is not an umbrella organization. Uh, so just one museum. So we needed to contact our colleagues in Georgia, who gave us the contact to Harry, for example, to Vasil, um, and other colleagues. So we needed to go to Georgia first in order to come to uh, Ukraine, but it took us one email. And I think this is maybe also a, a value that you don't always use uh, this network because fortunately crises don't come up uh, every day, but only up every second day, at least that's my impression in the last years. Um, and having these communication channels is a value and even better if you don't have to use them all the time, but if you have to use them, then they're there and the trust is already there. So I don't have any hesitation to call my colleague in, in Georgia and ask her whether she knows somebody who's good and reliable in Ukraine. And I trust her 100% that the names and contacts that she's going to give me are good. And I think this is super valuable. And then also to second what Andreas has said, for us as a network with little resources, really small resources, we are also not driving the truck. 
but we have a strong network. So we have the reach to museums in Europe. So what the obvious thing for us to do is to kind of pool what our members and the larger network is presenting to us and trying to structure it. Because as we've seen, there are so many parallel initiatives that you know, if you wanna get some kind of information, you have to look at 10 websites in parallel. Uh, so I think we're doing good uh, with what we do, and that is keeping an overview and and kind of, you know, arranging so so people can get active with whatever kind of means and resources they have. Yeah, well said, uh, Vasily. I have three parts of response. <laughs> yeah. But firstly, I wanted to uh, to say uh, sorry because I feel we uh, use only a part of possibilities that you provide. I tell to Julia and to the whole of Europe, uh, we are overcome to too much of messages of Gmails, and we have low capacity to answer everything and parallel to work. So so, so sorry, but in in time we will do this. I think the uh, question has uh, three levels. And first of all, um, a level of security. You know, uh, heritage is part of culture, and culture is about creativity. It's very hard to create under danger. So uh, uh, even people uh, in uh, Western Ukraine or uh, abroad from Ukraine uh, cannot create as before uh, thinking about souls under under fire and it's very hard to 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 <laughs> take you in in hands and to work and uh, my, many things that they should uh, uh, be there and and fight but no they they do not have soft skills and they just are sitting and reading and <laughs> so uh, security is very important and it's hard uh, to work without this. Secondly, uh, the lack of resources, mental resources, and uh, when you are in thoughts, you are there, and with your wife or husband or children under under fire, uh, you you uh, want to do something immediately, and. Um, it very it is very hard to tell somebody who come to you and tell oh I want to work tell me what to do you know it's hardly to think for one more people what uh, what to do <laughs> and so subjectivity is very important just uh, to to show the vision and take your your part of work and do because I have lack of resources to. <laughs> to tell everybody, 100 volunteers, what to do, you know? It's no, no time for this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and um, to, uh, so very important to have in team, uh, it can be a small team, but with people who are able to take responsibility and to make strong decisions in these realities we have. Not waiting for tomorrow, not saying, oh, if the ministry did this, but just uh, we, we have this reality and we, 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 we do what, what we can. This was the second level of subjectivity and uh, responsibility of everybody and of, of active people. And uh, it's also, I think, uh, very important is the network of, uh, of trust. You know, you, you have no, no time for mistake. You cannot uh, ask everybody if it's very important if for example it's about evacuation of museum collections of some or some dangerous place or something else you 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 should work with those whom you know that when it's about uh, people's life or or health and the third level is i think that something very interesting is happening now and uh, of course ukraine has uh, some part of post-Soviet legacy and uh, system problems from Soviet Union. But I think that many things uh, in which world lived for years, uh, they are damaged. 
with the start of this war. And um, many things didn't work, that doesn't work anymore, do, do not work. And I think it's a place when, where some, some new innovations, are not only in, uh, in uh, uh, economy or culture or uh, creativity appear, but also in management, in understanding, and maybe even in uh, senses. So I think uh, we also can be useful. And we also can be uh, a place uh, to test something new and some kind of R and D. Thank you. Fasi, let me let me ask a follow up question on that because that's a very um, mind expanding idea. Can you say a little bit more about what kinds of innovations you put the word management into that sentence? What sort of areas of innovation or change you imagine could happen through and as a result of the war. Give us a more specific idea of that, what you're thinking of when you think of that. I uh, try to do this shortly, <laughs> it's get a scene of another <laughs> meeting. But on a technical level, um, you know, it's about for example, during uh, the start of the war eight years ago, we had no um, information about museum collections uh, in Kiev, uh, only in museums. And uh, we should uh, do this very quickly to gather information. We have no uh, poli politician power for this, no money for this. so. In very short period, we uh, managed to to get photocopy of inventory books. You know, <laughs> for example, uh, today it's for example horizontal uh, communication, and uh, so not not vertical. You shouldn't wait where the ministry will uh, tell you, especially about evacuation or some complex decisions, because then it stops and nothing appears. You, you take responsibility, you do something, you communicate to coordinate. And uh, this b b balance uh, and horizontal uh, links are very, very important. And it's, I think it's our strength uh, about Russia uh, when all society <laughs> became active and start to do, uh, to, to find their niche and to do what, what they can. And it's hardly to, to destroy because there are no center, no one center. You destroy this and the, in another place it appears. But I think that the main um, thing is more higher. Uh, we, many people couldn't believe that it can be in 21st century, you know? Yes. And when we talk about the culture as uh, think, uh, which make us people. So which culture let country destroy the others? Yeah. What, what is this? What the culture is this? It's a kind of barbarian culture, you know? And it's hardly to understand and it's in, in everything. And uh, it, it's hardly to, to, to change the the in in mind when many many years it was about something other and uh, discourses was so <laughs> you know and we, we should rethink what is ukrainian culture what humanity put is put in our icons in our uh, sacral architecture in our uh, middle ages art you know it's uh, something more than just drawings, paintings. It's about humanity, attitude to, to everything. Mm. But I, I don't know how to say it shortly. But <laughs> this, is, this is your moment. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for trying, Vasily. <laughs> um, I, I, you can continue of, later. <laughs> yeah, no, it will be an ongoing conversation for sure. Um, and um, I, I'm thinking to, uh, to to go to Stefania for a moment. In the in the thinking and research that you've been doing as part of the 
Inos project and, and getting to know people in projects who are working on these bottom-up and top-down cultural initiatives. Are you, it's a hard question, but on my mind is, are you beginning to see some hints at maybe an alternative way of uh, managing or thinking about what cultural activity is beyond traditional institutions and organizations? Oh, well, um, what I can say from this little, some months of research on the topic, I think that people now talk more about citizen engagement. And that's not just to say, and like uh, uh, a beautiful phrase, but it has also a more deep meaning because uh, we need citizens both on the ground and abroad to be engaged and not only about providing data, okay, that's, that's understandable and that's the first thing we're thinking about, but also engage after in the post-conflict scenario and being actively engaged in their, also in their communities as well. Uh, so I'm thinking about a more broad um, uh, paradigm shift in attitudes and changes also in society and individuals. So what I'm experiencing this month, uh, I think that we have we have come to a point where citizens realizing what they can do, that they can be agents of change, but obviously they always need support and guidance. So I think that bottom up and down should be always uh, how to say interconnected and go together uh, to 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 achieve the what is the, our ultimate goal here. Um interested in that very much and Katrina do you want to uh, do you want a piece of this action before I go to the next question yes very quickly when when a, a war uh, breaks out we immediately think about humanitarian aid in the sense of uh, e e emergency but uh, it is valuable that here we look at the cultural heritage sector which sometimes stays neglected when uh, societies think about a war and our contribution here, I mean, of, of, of the community of cultural heritage is very important because we do something for uh, a sector that sometimes in, in a war seems not vital, but it is vital. So it's, it's, a, it's a contribution uh, to that. And all this social participation, civic citizen engagement is, is so crucial. I'm listening to you all through this whole session. Uh, and when I first started coming to Europe to work, uh, um, a, a project that Julie and I are both on an advisory for a board for Europeana, a digital cultural initiative of the European Commission, it was explained to me that the, the genesis of that organization was that a few European commissioners thought it would be a good idea if digital cultural people met more often from across Europe so that we wouldn't have World War III. That was at the, at the root of the explanation for why it's worth flying people around and meeting each other and talking about culture was to, to prevent and perhaps to respond to um, cultural stress. And I've thought about that many times about, as I've flown over to Europe over the last 10 or 15 years. And um, because of your comments, Vasily and Andreas and Julia and, and Stefani and Katarina, I'm really seeing the wisdom in that. Um, having that network and those connections and that trust be present across the cultural community so that it can be used when needed. Um, but on that note, maybe Julia, a question that's been on my mind uh, for you as I've been listening is you're in the middle of a 30,000 European museum institutions every day. Uh, and this digital revolution, so-called, has been uh, washing over that sector for years. And so many of the ideas that I've heard spoken about today, I think carry with them an intrinsically digital set of ideas about who can connect and who can speak and who can participate and who can lean in to be a part of a problem uh, or part of work as citizens. And I'm, I'm wondering how you think the cultural sector, um, how far the cultural sector, how far the museum sector has gone in kind of embracing that, that spirit of the original vision of the World Wide Web. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's say, let's say, um, with uh, the pandemic, a lot changed. 
And I think that again, in these crisis moments, when you don't have any other means to do it otherwise, then you suddenly realize, oh yeah, digital is not so bad after all. But we are all humans and we all are very uh, resistant to change. Uh, so I, I feel the museum sector is very slow, say, in adapting um, uh, digital, a digital understanding, maybe, because this is across all sectors. It's not about digital communication. It's about using digital in every aspect of, of work, basically, across the organization. There is still a lot to do. And uh, Mike, you were mentioning Europeana, this European platform for digital cultural heritage. And if you look at the actual, um, not user numbers, but the ones that provide information, so digital data, this is still very limited. So I'd say there is still uh, room for improvement, but we are on uh, a good way. But having said this, and this comes rather from the experience of the network, I feel that um, having digital meetings and uh, also finding digital great ways of interacting with each other uh, was super helpful during the two years. But I also realized that everything that everything new was actually based, new ideas, new projects, new corporations actually based on something that had happened before in person. Mm. So the basis is for me at least, but maybe I'm a dinosaur and uh, the next generation is probably gonna be way more flexible with that. But I, I feel that, that this spark of inspiration uh, still is based on something that's called trust. <laughs> And for me, it's it's more difficult to kind of make this trust happening um, on a digital level, at least when it, when it starts there. Is that a, an answer to your question? Uh, abs absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, and never a complete answer because it's a big complex question, but certainly a set of gestures about this moment that we're living in. And Andreas, I thought that you spoke very um, clearly and eloquently about just the the native participatory opportunity that's available in, in the world now and the ability to contribute a variety of skills. And, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to speak about that in any way you want, but I did want to ask you a specific question about kind of like the, the, the ancient gospels of open platforms, mm -hmm. internet archive, mm -hmm. open street map, and how much these platforms allowed you to do or what their the problems with them were as you tried to make important things happen in in, in ukraine yeah I, I can start off it, it's kind of um hooked on to Ju what julia was talking about about the digital transformation of society or whatever uh but one thing that has struck me is that we were we are 1500 people and we organize through uh, a Slack channel. It's not a, an open source, but it's a free to use uh, community platform for chatting and placing stuff in channels and so forth. And the the actual um, uh, work is done in a Google spreadsheet. You just, just think about that for a minute. We were 1500 people uh, editing a Google spreadsheet at the same time. It's the global access because that was the only way to do to, to actually make it happen. And it it works, which is totally insane. I mean, I have difficulties, you know, keeping track with with myself, basically. If I share a document with myself, it gets all messed up. But I, something had to do with, we, we shared something, this community. We had a, a very basic common, like, knowledge domain of the cultural heritage and that was you know plenty enough but i, I can also speak about uh, a little bit about the internet archive why do we use internet archive well it's uh, a global access and an open platform it doesn't cost anything it's known it's somewhat trusted i would say uh, even though uh, we have to all hope for that uh, Brewster Kale, the, the founder uh, of Internet Archive, doesn't go uh, 
evil, <laughs> not being evil, <laughs> have to sign up to that trademark. Uh, but th that was one, you know, it's open, it's it's useful, it's they are good people working there. But we're also seeking for, since we are a, um, a community of individuals, of course, we work at the institution and can, you know, make use of, of resources that we have in, in time, for instance. We can, I have time donated by my employer, for instance. They say, oh, well, we understand that you have a, a massive backlog now, but we, we do what you do, because it's good that you do it. Um, but we need, since we are uh, holding a, lo a lot of data, a lot of data that can potentially be very valuable, we need some some sustainability in, in, in the long term for that, because now we are relying on, on, the, on Amazon being generous. And That's they are very generous, but for how long are they going to be generous? We don't yes. know. So, so I think, you know, this like civil society doing stuff needs to be, you know, connected to, to institutions to, and I think that was, if I, I didn't understand it wrong, but I think that's a little bit what Stefania was mentioning uh, too, that you need to have a connection between uh, individuals and, and this kind of community work and, and, uh, to make it long lasting and 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 um, safeguarding in this case the material for long term we need to have some sort of partnership but i mean i think we 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 have the time to to let the bureaucracy have its its time because we can safeguard it for for as long as the the, the bureaucracy needs but i mean we got contacted by, I, I'm not going to mention who, but there were big institutions that reached out to, to Sucho and asking, hey, we are maybe thinking of, you know, doing something and perhaps we're going to uh, archive the web as well. And they, you know, contacted us, you know, two, two months into the war and we was like, yeah, kind of late, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah. that, yeah, I, I, I'm listening to you speak. Um, very cognizant of this um, problem with digitality that most of us have recognized over the last five or 10 years, which is the, the hollowing out of the concept of a, a digital public sphere, um, particularly in, within culture, particularly within state. In the states, we've ceded a lot of the responsibility for core societal cultural functions to corporate owned third party initiatives and within Europe from the European Commission there's a very strong sense now that the European Union ought to reclaim the public ownership of a lot of that public sphere. Um, that is a topic for another discussion, the pros and cons of that vision because it's not an easy uh, formula. But vastly it, it with with a few minutes um, running down uh, uh, towards the end of our webinar and scanning the, the chat messages to see if there are any questions from the audience. Vasily, I, I kind of wanted to ask you um, as, as the last remarks to uh, give some advice to uh, your, your colleagues here and, and the participants who are fortunate enough to not have their countries um, torn apart by war at the moment. And, and what what should they be focusing on to ensure that they're in a in a better position to um, not to do well for their cultures um, in a time of great change and crisis? It's a big question. Feel free to speak about anything you want to talk about to close up. But but that question is on on my mind. The question about advices about culture, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. We're we're um, we have uh, many of us think we have the luxury to plan and take our time to prepare. Uh, there's a great quote about the climate emergency that um, when it comes to climate, winning slowly is the same as losing. 
uh, another quote from Stefan Zweig, who wrote that uh, his recollection of World War II was that there seemed to be a large window in which it was possible to act, and then how quickly and suddenly that window could be closed. So I'm thinking about the people in this room and the potential for a life-changing emergency in anyone's life and culture at any moment. And perhaps acting you, asking you uh, fairly or unfairly to reflect a bit on what we ought to be doing in our lives and our work and our careers now with the awareness that, that uh, things could turn very difficult very quickly. <laughs> Had questions uh, and a uh, little time. So uh, first reflection is, uh, you know, um, we have still uh, traditions in Ukraine and we sing carols uh, during Christmas. We go from house to house uh, before COVID, of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, we play special games on Easter and uh, it's a part of culture which uh, I think uh, we, we have this part uh, bigger than, than in Western Europe, I think, because of globalization and other things. But I think it's very important. And each, each nation, each country has its own traditions. And uh, this part of culture is, uh, cannot be uh, uh, put into children uh, in other way than example. Mm -hmm. So it's only uh, when you believe and you do this and your children or others see this, um, they, they will continue this after your death. And, uh, you know, during Soviet times, uh, it was forbidden and uh, everybody did this. <laughs> Uh, special people looked after after uh, to no, to to say about this to KGB to uh, security service of Soviet Union. But in spite of everything, people <laughs> sing carols, uh, went to church, and and when uh, Ukraine became independent 30 years ago, everything was old. But people. Uh, um, start to do this less mm. but i i think that you should do this mm. any tradition that you have it's important in spite of globalization there is something i think it's uh, this variety which is uh, part of innovation so when we are in design thinking on other other ways of of creating uh, uh, variety is a possibility to to do something uh, unexpected, some synergies that cannot be, uh, you cannot think about this before. It just appear after, in, during intera interaction, um, but this interaction should be with dignity and with, uh, so it's the first moment. Uh, so, uh, and I think that we, we should think about, uh, memory is important. We should think who we are because uh, the war in Ukraine, it's not the war um, uh, for for territory or for some. Uh, so it's a war against our heritage. About uh, not 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 to let Ukraine and Ukrainians be as a state as an independent uh, culture. So it's a war against culture. And uh, I, I uh, ask, I suppose that you, sh you should think about this because uh, there are a variety of cultures and uh, Ukrainian culture uh, differs, but still uh, thinking more generalized, it's a European country, uh, culture. And we have a lot of common things. And uh, this uh, culture of Russia is other culture. Uh, it's Asian and it differs. And I think that we fight not only for uh, our country, but for some values which are common with Europe. And uh, here, uh, something bigger is defined than only uh, the, our country's life, you know? And I, uh, 
I think uh, you, you can think about this, that it's uh, maybe more important than just uh, Ukrainian people lives. It's a part of our great war and you, you can think also about your cultures, about things uh, about which we didn't talk before and didn't think that it can be in 21st century. Okay. Those are the last words today, Vasily. Thank you so much. Um, I should being... stop because it cannot be <laughs> completed. So <laughs> You gave us, that was very, uh, as, as throughout, uh, beautifully done. And uh, I personally, and I think all the attendees here are very grateful to you for um, opening up to us today. Katrina, Stefania, Julia, Andreas, thank you all for being here today. Steph uh, Katrina, thank you for putting this panel together and um, best of luck and uh, be well, everyone, and do, do good work. This recording will be online in a few uh, days or weeks. Stay tuned to the uh, Web to Learn website, Web to Learn, um, uh, Web to Learn .eu, and the social channels to um, stay in touch. And best of luck, everyone, and have a great uh, afternoon. <laughs>